Hi, Bob. How are you? Great to great to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. How are you? Yeah, um, yeah, really well, thanks. W um, w whereabouts are you at the moment? I'm in Huntington Beach at our board riders headquarters. Nice. And how? Yeah, how's everything been over there? Uh, it's been good. Very, very busy. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts. You know, it was, it was difficult during COVID where we didn't have a lot of people in the building, but slowly but surely they're coming back. I would say we're usually about. 50 to 60 percent full on the big days and then you know 20 percent on the on the lesser days but yeah it's good to have people back in the building and you know our our brands work with a lot of heart and touchy feeling we like to be you know around the people and read the tea leaves and have meetings that are in person and you know talk about product or marketing or whatever and so it's it's nice to have everybody kind of uh, rolling back now it's good yeah and it's 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 better doing it face to face i mean there's a lot of stuff that you can do online but you know, to kind of get yeah, I mean, everybody's kind consent. of Zoom called out to tell you the truth. I, I think that, you know, you can do as much as you can do, but people, people, at least in this, in our company, love to be together and hang out and, you know, have a beer after work in the center circle or, or you know, have these meetings with 30 people in them where you can, everybody ha can weigh in and you can really talk about things. And yeah, the Zoom call, I think the Zoom calls and all that stuff, you just feel like a little bit inhibited and, and don't really yeah. you know, feel like it's your time to insert yourself or not, whatever. Whereas in person, you're just, it's just all a big, you know, lively conversation. And I, I enjoy that a lot more. Yeah. Nice. Well, um, Bob, if it's okay with you, I'd love to kind of, to jump back because it's been, yeah, it's a bit of a wild, a wild story. And uh, yeah, I'd like love to kind of hear, hear it from you uh, as sort of how, how you kind of got into surfing in the first place, um, growing up in land and then, yeah, like... <laughs> Yeah, I grew up in Pasadena, which is, you know, like an hour inland from the coast. And uh, I was a tennis player and all that and a little leaguer and all that. And so I, I, but friends of mine in Pasadena, um, when I was about nine years old, took me to the beach. I mean, we've been going to the beach, but, and he was a surfer, young surfer, and he threw me in the water and pushed me into a wave and, and actually taught me how to surf. And I was just, you know, smitten. I loved the whole deal, the the standing on the board and having the board move and the wave is moving and, you know, then getting out and, you know, sand between my toes and the sun and salt on my skin. I was just, I just love the whole deal. Anyway. So I can use, continue surfing. My father along the way gave me a movie camera. I, I started making my own homemade super eight surf films <laughs> okay. and uh, actually uh, paid my way through college with the surf films showing them up down the coast. But I was totally immersed in surfing the whole culture, uh, that's a whole other story, but I, I, I just love the whole deal. And, and so I went to business school at USC finally, um, after graduating from Sam Real high school and I, um, uh, uh, majored in business and I finished four years. And in the meantime, I'd gone on some real major surf trips, uh, during the off season and then the summers. And one of the places I went to was Bali along the way. And there I met Jeff Hackman who sort of changed my life. Uh, one of my very best friends forever. And we got to know each other really well in Bali. <laughs> You do kind of wait, everything. Wait, this was like early seventies, wasn't it? Like kind of this like early seventies. Seventy, uh, yeah, seventy-two, seventy-three. Okay. And met him down there along with Phil Byrne and some other great people that became part of my life. And I also met my future uh, bride and that Ty from New Zealand. So that one trip just changed my whole life with my future partner in business, my future partner partner in life. So um, it was amazing. And uh, when I got back, I finished school and Jeff started having me come over and house it for him while he traveled the world and surf contests. And that was an honor to, you know, hang out at Jeff Hackman's house and surf. With all over the in Hawaii, right? Yeah. Surf with all the boys. Yeah. yeah. Surf with all the boys and off, with the, off the wall and all that stuff. And uh, Jeff started talking about these board shirts coming out of Australia called Quicksilver. And I didn't think too much of them. They were just looked like any other pair of shorts. He held them up and he had a pair and his pair were like, cream and brown <laughs> pretty not not too fabulous and but he just talked about the virtues of this brand and how on fire it was in the real core of the surf you know group and um so what happened is this it started in torquay in victoria australia and a guy by the name of alan green every, every time all the surfers would go to bell's beach at easter time for the contest Alan Green would make them a pair of custom curated, you know, pick your colors, pair of board shorts. 
So all the guys would go down there from Mark Richards to Simon Anderson to Bruce Raymond, whatever, and they'd get their pairs of board shorts made. And, and then they'd go about wherever they came from. And next thing you know, um, these shorts were being seen in every cover shot, center spread, editorial, whatever, because all the guys just wore them because nobody else gave anything free. So might as well have, you know, wear Quicksilver. And they was it a marketing hot. thing from Al? Like, What's was that? that just sort of like, was it a marketing kind of ploy? No, from, no. I mean, it was just, there, that was all he, he was just like, just, like he's going to give it to friends and. Yeah. He just gave, well, he, he was starting Quicksilver in Torquay. No, no question about it. But when he, yeah. he did the modern day, you know, influencer thing by just giving away shorts to all the best surfers and off yeah. they went to South Africa, Japan, America, uh, Hawaii, Brazil, wherever they came from. And next thing you know, we're seen in every freaking magazine around the world. So Jeff started when he came back from this trip where he won the contest of bells, he, he started, you know, talking about the virtues of doing this Quicksilver thing. He goes, you know, what are you doing? You're, you finished school. Let's go, let's do some business. And I go, well, I'm, yeah, but I'm taking a year off and I'm going to have a business experience, but then I'm going to go back to graduate school and get my degree in business. And I want to get a minor in cinema, which or major, I'm sorry, finish my major in cinema. Cause I want to go in the, I want to go in the film business. That, that's what I wanted to do. So yeah. Jeff convinced me to go, you know, do this little Quicksilver thing. And, and by the way, everything I learned in the business school about doing a business plan and a cash flow statement and the five P's and all this stuff, I didn't do any of that for Quicksilver because this was going to be a situation. We're going to import shorts from Alan Green. We're going to go up and down the coast and sell them. going to pay him back. And then I'm going to go to graduate school. And thank you very much, Jeff. Have a nice life. <laughs> and Jeff's going to go back to whatever he's going to do. So that's how we started. But what really happened is that Alan Green could not supply any shorts to us. So we had to make them ourselves, which meant we were sort of tricked oh, yeah. into manufacturing right out of the gate, which is, you know, it's a daunting thing to be sort of in the apparel industry anyway. But when you have to like sort of like self figure out how to make the shorts when there's no industry and especially nothing in Southern California, you know, Newport Beach area. So Jeff and I had to go around, drive around all over LA, look, look, find fabric that's appropriate, find the snaps, find the Velcro, source the label, figure out cutting, figure out sewing, all this stuff on a garment. And we did over the summer of 1976. And we walked into our first store, which was Hobie, the Hobie shop in, um, in uh, uh, Dana Point and the Val Surf Shop in the Valley and Newport Servants Board in Newport. We walked in kind of the same day on all three accounts and we sold them our first pairs of board shorts and they were sold out in three seconds. So, and we we started just, you know, living the old American dream of in back of my Volkswagen van, going up and down the coast and selling board shorts, meeting these great, you know, owners of the shops that are the very core surf shops. Uh, we surfed everywhere. We hung out with these people. We had, you know, meals with them. We, um, we just had the time of our life. So we did that up and down the West coast, up and down the East coast and all over Hawaii and really, um, sort of secured a lot of, uh, core retail shops and, and made our board shorts sort of famous there. We we're at the beginning of what I would call the modern surf industry. I mean, there's certainly an industry before us, but it really sort of the longboard revolution and all of a sudden there's a shortboard era and that's when we started. And yeah. from there it, it launched, you know, we, 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 we ground zero of that, that industry startup, you know, and right behind us was Billabong and gotcha and, you know, and Jimmy Z's and, and Maui and sons and all these other things that came, but, but I'm really proud that we were sort of there at the very root of it. Was anyone doing it before like hang 10 or was anyone like making these shorts? Yeah, in sure. The there was a number of before- like, there was a number of sort of department store brands, I call them, like, like you know, uh, Hang 10 and uh, um, well, I can't think of any right now, but Hang 10. And then there was also some core ones. Caton was around and Burwell Britches and Sundeck. But they okay. all their shorts were made of real heavy duty nylon, stiff nylon. So when we came in, our shorts were 100 percent cotton, very comfortable. Um, they sort of have a little bit of give with the stretch. They uh they, weren't, they didn't dry fast, but we didn't care about that. We cared about comfort, performance. They fit high in the back, low in the front. They had a scallop leg, um, snaps and Velcro. So we, because we knew it was like to paddle through a you know ten foot wave and have your shorts blow off. So we made them very particular to the sport of surfing. That's where the name came from. 
board shorts, surfboard shorts. Yeah. We were the first to brand it that. I mean, I wish we had patented it at that time or trademarked or whatever, but we didn't. <laughs> but so Alan Green came up with board shorts. And these were certainly for the sport of surfing. And therefore, they didn't need to be stiff nylon, you know, drying a second shorts. They needed to be something that was comfortable and uh, would, would stand the test of time with a really hardcore, this you know, really um, uh, nice cotton uh, but very, um, uh, very, uh, very well, you know, very expensive cotton fabric. So that's that was the root of our of our uh, product was the fabric. And anyway, that's sort of like yeah, the sorry, beginning of it. Anyway, and, and and when you when you were then going in in your in in your VW bus like around the country and like going going visiting all the all the surf shops. Did you then like realize when when the demand was was pretty high and they were they were snapping it up quickly? Were you like you know we're, we're onto something here? Maybe yeah, I'm not no, going to go into film and we're going to yeah. Kind well, of... you know the first the first year it was just like I said, just fun hanging out with Jeff and, and meeting all these great you know retailers that are still our good friends today. I mean, it's either, it's either the same guy that owns a shop or now his son is in there running it or his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> So when we go on the road trips now, I, I end up hanging out with a with a guy that I know. We have beers and chit chat and catch up and tell stories. And then the our rep or our sales managers working with their people that run the shop now. So it, it's all very circular to you know forty five years later. But um, we're we're uh, it, it was just so much fun. And then the first year passed, and I thought, okay, well, I'll give it another year. And then second year, and we were you know exploding in sales and you know for that world and for that time of the year at that time anyway. And just uh, having the having a ball, and people loved us, and we were doing good product, and we were hot in the surf industry, and like I was able to surf all over the place, and a lot of trips, and all travel, and all that. So it was just great. So we just continued, and I never got to go to film school, so that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> and was it, was it quite a small team back then, like in in that sort of second third year, or was or were you kind of having to get help? Quite no, it was and, Jeff and bring people on and. We had a couple of um, investors that came and went, and and then a few more that came and went. But it was really Jeff, just Jeff and me, and maybe a very you know small core. We had a, a woman in the back it's called Shirley that showed all of our custom uh, board shorts, especially that was especially important during the whole Echo Beach era, where she was sewing checkerboards and stars and stripes and harlequins all over all over all over board shorts for all the crew in Newport Beach. But yeah, and we had you know we had a, a an offsite accountant person that kept the books and it was very 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 small team for the first i would call it uh eight years okay and and how was how was it during the late 70s when like, i guess that was the start of a of, of professional surfing and the whole world tour um yeah, how, yeah well, how, how was that experience i was i would just i mean there was when we started there was a loose knit tour of guys just would um, all the all the crew that were the best servers in the world would travel the world and go to South Africa and surf Jeffrey's Bay and then they'd go to uh, Torquay and surf you know Bell's Beach at, during the Bell's contest and they'd go to Hawaii and then they go to so there was a loose knit tour going on anyway so mm -hmm. and you know it was people on the beach with clipboards and pencils and scoring and lots of you know beers and drinking afterwards and it was a real was, to me that was a really fun era for like what i you know professional surfing became much more standardized when asp you know took over and made it more legitimate and prize money and all these things and now we have wsl so but there's always been kind of a tour um of which we've been a part of from day one i mean we sponsor yeah. a lot of riders that are on the tour we have you know we sponsor tour events we you know, we've gone big waves to regular waves to global tur tournaments that, you know, started the dream tour with G-Land. So we've, we've been involved with that professional surfing thing all along. And only because, first of all, it's, it's sort of duty of care to the sport. And second of all, it's great marketing and editorial for all the core magazines. And a lot of times it then ends up in the national and, you know, global media. But, but you know, we we've always aligned our very core product with a very core audience which is the surfer hardcore surfer and then to a very core distribution channel which is surf shops and the snow shop so as long as you keep that thing aligned then you'll be fine and we felt like um surf events were very much um, aligned with that sort of methodology of speaking to the core all the time was there any like now looking back over like 45 years was there any kind of standout event or 
like location would you say whether I don't know whether it was G Land well, or, or 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 the Eddy or yeah. <laughs> well, you, you name both of them. I would say the the two most spectacular <laughs> things we did were the you know we started the Dream Tour at G Land, which was a total break from tour sort of protocol. They were having all their contests at city beaches with huge crowds on the beach. That's what they wanted. And then, but the surf was usually pretty typical of you know shore breaks in Huntington Beach or Manly Beach, whatever uh, yeah. crumbly little beach breaks you know, all these really good surfers on their, um, you know, surfboards are a lot more modern now, but back then they were pretty hard to maneuver around these little teeny waves. So, you know, the surfing was unspectacular and the crowds loved it and all that kind of stuff. But we launched the G land thing because we specifically wanted, wanted the, wanted our, one of our contests on the tour to be in, you know, remote jungle location, you know, no audience except for on the, on the, when you finally broadcast it. Yeah. And it was fantastic. And then the G land contest ran for three years. We got chased out of Indonesia because of the whole terrorist situation and we moved it to Tavarua and, and all that. So um, I would say that, and then definitely the eddies have all been fantastic. Um, and uh, fortunately that, that went away for us, but uh, we had a, we had a fun, I think it was 20, 25 years with the eddy. Um, and uh, you know, to us, you know, Hawaii is the home of surfing, the, sort of the heart and pulse of the sport, you know, itself with the history and, you know, Duke and, and the, you know, North Shore and lifeguards and all the stuff that goes on over there that we've been part of ever since day one. And Hawaii is a huge, um, you know, visual part of what any of us surf companies do. So Hawaii is important. We started this big wave thing. We weren't specifically, we're not on the ASP tour of that because we wanted to do our own thing and invite mm -hmm. our own people and pro broadcast it and score it a different way. And the opening ceremonies were amazing. And, and we, we, and we knew that it wasn't, we had the surf had to happen in perfect, you know, 20 to 30 foot surf at YMA, which is not an easy thing to get. And we needed eight hours of surfing to do the contest. So it only happened five or six times over the whole, over the whole span of the thing. But we every year we had an opening ceremonies. So we always thought, you know, here we're here to celebrate the life and legacy of Eddie Icao. So the ceremony was all about that. We had the um, the, uh, the the food. We had the paddle out, the prayers. Everything we did was to was to acknowledge Eddie. And then if we had the event, you know, that was a bonus. That's that's yeah. the way we looked at it. So it was highly highly successful and really important to Hawaii for all those years. So we were very proud of that. And then we, we established contests also in the, you know, in our regions of Hasagor area, Capertone, Capertone um, Australia. Over, over on the Gold Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Gold Coast um, and, and elsewhere. So, and we've been involved with a lot of the lower level contests that happened all over the world. So we were really immersed into athletes and events. Yeah. And, and when, or, or, or sort of what, what brought on the decision of, of taking the company public? When so was that was just, a, you know, it's a financial deal. So you, you get to a okay. certain point and you need everybody is a, who starts companies knows there's always about the money. And so, you know, who's going to finance this thing? So you, of course, start with friends and family. Then you switch to sort of like people that are in your world that you trust. And then you run out of money again and then you need more and you need more. So for us, it was just, you know, a way of financing the company. We just looked at yeah. it instead of going to a bank or to more, you know, cousins, uncles, brothers, friends, and family, whatever, that let's just go uh, do a public raise. We're the first, you know, company in our industry for sure that did anything like that. And a lot of people thought, oh God, here they go. They're going to go the way of OP. They've, they've lost their, they're, they're chasing the money. They're going to chase big distribution. They're going to go into department stores. Too bad. It's no longer going to be in the surf shops, blah, blah, blah. Was that. there loads of backlash? Was there that, was, that, that was what we heard from all of our competitors, of course, because they were looking for okay, an yeah. angle. So what we did is we just, you know, took the, 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 the public money and we brought in all the right people to grow properly in the core market. And we took, so now we're doing more and more sales because we had more and more products. We had more and more reach with our sales force and our sales managers and no department stores, just all growing the core. Therefore, we have made a lot more profits and we just fed the profits right back into more team riders, more window displays, more fixtures in the, in the hardcore surf shops, more signage, 
uh, more support of that surf shop and their riders and their town and their beaches with foundation work and lifeguards and all that stuff. And so we just proved, you know, double down on proving to them, no, we're with you. We're with you now and forever after. And it's, it's very true even today. So, so we just proved them all wrong. And then some other companies went public later on. And it's the same story when we started Roxy, everybody said we couldn't do a, a girl's line. So we went, well, why not? They go, because you, if you're men's, you got to stay in men's. You can't do any women's. And we went, well, oh, really? And that, that, was, like, that was a couple of years later, right? That was in like, well, that was in, or yeah, it was many years later, but um, it was 1989, 90, 91, right in there. We started Roxy and, I mean, everybody, same thing. All the other competitors would go around and just, ha, 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 there they go. You know, what a whim, stupid decision again. And we did it and turned Roxy into a, you know, $500 million company. And, and, uh, and then they all, they, all of them started doing women's. <laughs> so we've heard this our whole life, you know, going public, um, it, doing women's, uh, starting a retail store, going online first, you know, all these things that we have done, but we just feel like if you do it properly, you're not, you're not going to lose your your core as long as you stay true to them so yeah that was our theory and and where where were the ideas coming from was there was sort of like would it be like that would be the marketing division or it sort of be would it be you and jeff as as well as you know kind of co-founders well, thinking about if you, if you, yeah the, the decisions like if you take it right back to like so we're so we're making board shorts and we were we were licensed by alan green to do the board shorts in america and mexico he also licensed an early group in europe he licensed a group in, uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, New Zealand, I think. There's a few. But all those people, and this is I'm talking about early days, all the people were responsible yeah. for making their own shorts, following the blueprint of Alan Green, and then paying them a small royalty uh, just to acknowledge that they own the trademark. So that was how we were set up early. But Alan Green was you know, pure genius in that he – he uh, figured out this thing about the 1% pool. So we all contributed 1% in addition to the royalty to a pool, 1% of sales to a marketing pool. So every uh, okay. Easter, there was a core group of us that would go down to Torquay and we'd hang out with Alan Green and John Law, the other founder, for a couple of weeks. And we would you know, sit in a van and go surfing or we'd go to his house or we'd go to the beach and hang out or whatever. And we'd figure out how we're going to spend this 1% pool. But it was only spent on things that have affected the global, um, the global company, not, you know, specifically local. Region, so this yeah. is where we sponsor rabbit Bartholomew and Tom Carroll and later on Kelly Slater. And this is how we did the crossing trip. And we, all these things came out of the early marketing budget. So, so we did, we, in that core group was really Alan and John, Alan Green, and John Law, myself, uh, Bruce Raymond, you know, Danny Kwok, uh, Jeff Hackman, and we would we would um, figure out for the rest of the team the best way to spend that money, but individually we all had our own our own budgets and our own marketing departments. So in my group in America it was, you know, it was it was Danny Clark, it was myself, it was you know uh, Richard Wolcott in the early days, um, and some other people. Um, but we we um, we navigated our our trajectory with a very small group of core people that understood surf and later skate and snow and uh yeah. that's always been very effective for us and would you say i mean was that kind of just like ideas would come around when you guys would all be together and you, like you were saying you were sort of surfing together or will you be like not necessarily sitting in a boardroom but more like kind of Sit, like sitting on the boards in the lineup and <laughs> down into well it, it, it of course happens at work in boardrooms when you're like trying to nail a problem or try to figure out a solution or whatever you're doing but most of it honestly happens on surf trips i'll give you an yeah. example i mean the the whole crossing uh five years of the crossing boat going around the world happened you know the idea came from us lying on the top of the indie trader me bruce raymond and and uh, martin daly looking at the stars watching the satellites going through and just beautiful day we had a wonderful day of surf we're in what martin described as a bliss attack and we're sitting there and we're just talking about all this stuff and i think it was bruce ram just goes like god we should just try to do this why don't we just do this year round and we always went wow there's an idea <laughs> so the crossing got launched i mean so it just it's it's amazing where you know a lot of our early ideas came from you know in a car driving down the coast to joanna to go surfing from bells because bells was flat and johanna was five foot and we go down there and just sit in the car on these two or three hour rides and just 
brainstorm and somebody would take notes and we just air a lot of things. We'd go for a surf, come back and revisit them and go over and over. And the next thing you know, we'd, we'd arrive home, we'd have five things we wanted to spend our money on. So the, it's, this, this thing just happened organically and I, and I, we're not alone. This is how what happens in every, every company really. So, yeah. And, and with the crossing, I mean, that was sort of something that was, well, I guess it was combining the whole like marketing side of it, bringing on all the, all the, all the team riders, but then also that kind of environmental um, initiative and aspects around reef protection. And yeah, we wanted to, we wanted to like cross. Multi- yeah. Well, we, we wanted to change the crossing directions, not just being a surf trip. Um, although yeah. it really was a surf trip, but we wanted to, um, we wanted to um, open the aperture of what it was the meaning of it. So when we traveled, I mean, it went around the world five times. And uh, every time we pulled, we obviously we found thousands of surf spots that nobody had ever, you know, laid eyes on, which was yeah. amazing. So in every one of those trips, we'd load on a group, whether it's our a a plus team riders like kelly and tom carroll whatever or we put on the the older guys you know jamie mitchell blah 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 or we put on the young guns you know the young kids yeah. or we put on the you know the girls um the more established girls and then the young girls and you know and uh and we just and then we had the legends a few times i mean so we we just loaded up and then we go to all the surfing and then we'd go to the next port and drop them all off and, and then the boat would chug along to, you know for a lot of hours to get to the next spot and then we'd load another group so we had that surfing discovery aspect but whenever we arrived at a you know a, a you know, sort of a island with local people we always would go into town and we'd try to meet the people and and, and you know hang out with them and help them in yeah. any way we could with water filters or, or help them with, you know, how to, how to burn their, you know, how to make food, not inside their, their huts, but maybe take it outside. And so there's all these things that we did and, and, uh, and, and we were more local oriented because we wanted to make sure that we, 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 we left it in good stead and people enjoyed our visit rather than just going in there and surfing their waves and eating their food and, you know, scramming. So, and, and, and we became pretty famous for that. And we also had, like you said, we had Reef Check on board, and that's a, a United Nations established checking mechanism for coral reefs around the world. And and our surfers, whoever was on the boat, would you know dive and you know take photographs and measure and 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 all this information we we broadcast back to Surf uh, Reef Check, and then that we we'd be part part of their international monitoring thing. So it was a scientific element. Then of course there was a humanitarian effort with our Board Riders Foundation. We would we would do. Um, some projects that, that supported this whole thing, like the five gyres and whatever, whatever. So it had a lot of, I had a lot of assets, but whenever we arrived into big towns like New York city or Dana point Harbor or, or wherever, I mean, we'd be meet, meet and greet. And this is stuff that Jim Kempton did for us, but we, you know, the whole town would come out, the mayor would come out. They would yeah. sometimes the, the boats would shoot the, the water over us from the fire boats and, <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. People just everyone would get involved, right? The, the boat was painted with this amazing um, tattoo graphic, yeah. so it became an iconic symbol of all this stuff that Quicksilver was doing. And I mean, it was amazing. The uh, sort of like in today's world, the likes, the followings, whatever you want to call that. But it was it was a huge deal for the surf industry and for us for sure. And and for when we pulled into ports and. Then we'd show up and all the media would come down. We'd meet and greet them and serve them cocktails and walk them around the boat and tell them stories and show them videos. And, and they would just love it. And all of our accounts could come. We'd have events on the boat. So it was a, it was a, there was a lot of purpose when we were actually in a, in a port where there was no surf. But then, yeah. of course, most of the stuff happened at the surf spots. <laughs> and like, like with, with all this going on, I mean, we, like what, what would you say that, that now was sort of one of the biggest gambles sort of during that time of sort of like after after taking it public and yeah it, is there anything that kind of sort of stands out would you say as sort of one of the one of the i would say decisions? one of the biggest gambles yeah one of the biggest gambles in the whole company was when we introduced the echo beach range in sort of 81 i would say um alan green once again back to him being the founder he was <laughs> in his own way was just getting bored of like you know of, of uh, solid board shorts, two tone, you know, different color waistband and the main short. And he had some Hawaiian prints and just boring, boring, same old. So he was a big, um, he's a big horse racing fan. 
back to he oh. runs a lot of horse races, horse horses, races them all the time. He's won the Melbourne Cup, whatever. So he's big time. He's into it. And he just he he just had this vision about the jockey outfits, how iconic they were, and how from a lot of way a lot of yards away you can see the the jockey outfits, the polka dots and the stripes and the stars and all that kind of stuff. So he had um, Simon Buttonshaw, original artist at Quicksilver, do a whole artistic range of these graphics: polka dots, stars, stripes, harlequins, um, and other. And mm -hmm. he didn't tell anybody. He ordered a bunch of fabric. And these, and these were bright oh, wow. color, bright colors. Really <laughs> he he kept his little secret, and it was like, right, yeah, right. and 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 the right size and scale to look really good on a board short. And then he just he made a bunch of shorts, and just for the the season's order, the the stores would order what they order. But instead of set, getting what they ordered, he just he just sent them the, the Echo Beach board shorts. And the guys who got him just called, called Alan Green. What are you doing? Like, there's no way we're gonna sell these. And Alan goes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put them on the put them on the racks and see what happens. And Alan Green's back there just going, Oh, please, dear God, because <laughs> basically gambled the whole company on a print range. And sure enough, they blew up. And so we had the benefit of watching them explode over there. So in California, we you know, did the same thing. We, we bought fabric on top of the fabric Alan Green bought. We brought them into to Costa Mesa. We were, you know, a, a, a sort of a season behind because when it's their summer, it's our winter. So now the summer's coming along for us. So now we can launch Echo Beach board shorts. And it all just magically aligned with all the stuff that was going on in Newport Beach at the time. What was happening, so everything was white surfboards and black wetsuits all yeah. in California because it was too cool to like be bright or be colorful, whatever. So Echo Beach board shorts came in, in Newport Beach. We had Danny Kwok and Preston Murray and Jeff Parker and all these people that love the board shorts. They knew we had Shirley in the back that could adopt the board shorts to actually customize the shorts for these characters at 54th Street in Newport Beach. And if, it effectively we started calling it Echo Beach off the, off the, um, of the board shorts hottest hundred yards, whatever you call that. And, uh, and all the photographers come down there because you have Danny Kwok and all these guys like riding their surfboards. He's in the, and then Lance Collins made the surfboards to match the board shorts. He had the, the bright color graphics going on in Newport beach. You had new wave music. You had the yeah. way they did their hair. We had these, you had, you know, the, the break dancing, the music, the language, the, all that stuff was all just happening right in Newport And this would be, beach. In all, in all the surfing magazines as well, right? So kind of doing, oh, doing that. Well, they the just whole flocked thing. to it like... because it was something they could put in the in the magazines now that was just fantastic versus the boring old stuff. I mean, believe me, the rest of the country kind of hated us because they didn't want to break rank. They didn't like this at all. It was like a full movement, but started in Newport Beach and just started spreading. And and then, of course, you know, now it just released a whole momentum through all of the other brands too. Gotcha yeah. doing what they were doing and Billabong. And everything. So all of a sudden it was just like, color graphics anything goes so yeah. it was it was radical and and when did all the like all the competitors and a lot of like a lot of surf brands kind of popping up like when did that all start was that sort of around around that time then would you say, or, was it uh, I would say yeah with us everything started popping up about middle 80s because you know we had we had the uh, the actual surf tour going we had a we had trade shows now asr yeah. show and then we had um, sort of we were getting a lot of attention from, you know, national, international media about surf and and all this sort of stuff. And so um, and that's when all the all the other brands, well, a lot of other brands started uh, in that same period. OK. And it went a little bit uh, street also with Stussy and some of the brands like that. Yeah. Um, but definitely there was a whole bunch of surf brands at the time that, you know, many of them have gone now, but it was sort of like a like a total refresh button uh, and, you know, going along with modern surfing with, you know, guys doing a lot more radical stuff than they could on longboards and that whole deal just exploded. Yeah. And, and did like a lot of them get out, obviously like when, when the recession hit and everything and then kind of, I mean, that was sort of companies were going. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> everything changes over we, we had a long period of time that happened since 1976 when we started. Yeah. So yeah, lots of stuff happened. Multiple recessions, you know, nine 11, um, crash in 08. That's another you know, event in 1990, 
1991, uh, where we were all doing fantastic because we all had neon in our lines. And then neon died in 91. I mean, just died, just like fell off a cliff. And the surf industry started it and did it really well. So it was a huge part of our businesses. But at the same time, in 91, we had shark attacks on both coasts in Hawaii, which scared the crap out of people for going to the beach. We had, you know, they uh, finally were measuring urban runoff, which they'd never done before and found out that most most of the beaches were polluted with the runoff going in them. And then, you know, the whole thing about skin cancer and melanoma came out. So don't go in the sun. So we had don't go in the sun because you'll get skin cancer. Don't go on the beach because you might trip over a syringe needle because it's polluted on the beach or get hepatitis in the water or whatever. And, or you might get bitten by a shark. And by the way, the best thing in the surf industry, neon died all in the same year. So these are <laughs> real life events that just happen. And, you know, we've been through a bunch of them. So yeah. it, it, it's just shit happens. <laughs> yeah. And then it would be sort of riding in between like, you know, popularity as as well. Right. It was sort of, you know, yeah, I mean, going in and out of yeah. fashion and. Well, that's what happened after 91. Everybody said the whole cry when national media was surf dead. <laughs> okay, great. Surf's dead. <laughs> so we all got together in Europe. We had all our people from all over the world get together. And we decided, well, okay, surf's dead. We're going to be a lot smaller, but we're still going to stay with surf. That's all we know. So let's just be a smaller company and let's, you know, hunker down. And, but from that came a lot of great stuff for us. We, we knew that we were going to be smaller, but, we knew that we, we had our dedication to the core, but the core then was younger and older. So we started yep. an older guy's line, which today is Waterman, and we started a boy's line. They're both huge businesses at the bookends of Main State Quicksilver. And older, younger, male, female. That's when we started Roxy out of that period to be relevant in women's. And then we start, you know, now we also had just wholesale business. So we thought, let's dabble with retail. So we started a retail store, which is now, yeah. you know, 800 stores. And we decided we need to be snowboard, be in snowboarding. So we bought LibTech and we became really relevant in snow, the snowboarding world. And today our, our snowboard collections and Quicksilver, Roxy and some of our other brands are unbelievable. And we, we decided we needed to be, in the water with women's first and therefore bikinis, we bought the Raisins group, Raisins, Leilani, Radio Fiji, to be in bikinis. So we became really um, great in women's swimwear. And we've been like that with Quicksilver and Billabong and, I mean, sorry, Roxy, Billabong and Billabong Girl, whatever, forever. So all these things were done. And we bought, also to be in skate, we bought DC. So yeah. to, after 91, everything changed, but it was the same company. We want to be relevant to the core market and we want to make core products, core distribution with core, with the core people in mind to sell it to. So, and that's, we've never really, and we want to be multiple brand now to satisfy younger, older, male, female, global, whatever. So um, that's what we became as a company out of the deluge in 91. Yeah. And, and with that move into, in, into snow, and um, that was sort of, I guess, then the, the, the like that, that was the decision to go and, 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 and buy Rossignol, right? Which is sort of a wrap. Yeah, that, that was another, um, you know, what happened there is we were, we were the biggest fish in the whole surf sea. So surf industry sea, we wanted it, we wanted to grow because we're a public company. We're, you know, we, we need to grow. We also have a lot of employees. We want to give them raises. We want to give them bonuses. So the only way you can do that is through growth, more, more sales, more profits, more margin, whatever. So we decided, well, what other zones are there out there? And we looked at a whole bunch of them and we decided the outdoor world, outdoor you know, market is a good one. So we found Rosigno, which is a hundred year old brand, one of the most recognized brands in the world. Did a lot of research on them. They made primarily skis. And mostly skis that just go fast downhill. That's all they really focused on. So we thought we could buy the company. You know, we knew we knew it was skis. It's hard goods. It's molds. It's you know, that's it's only seasonal. Blah 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 blah. It had all the bad parts of it too, but great brand. So we yeah. thought we could take the brand and quarantine the ski part into go go downhill Olympics and all that stuff, and then take the brand and turn it into a huge outdoor apparel brand, kind of like you know, Patagonia or North Face or whatever. And that's what, why we bought it and what our intentions were. And we, you know, got the whole project started and, you know, the market crashed in 2008 and just didn't fit in with our portfolio anymore. So we sold it. Just didn't work for us. Yeah. 
and and that was just down to like well i guess it was like a, a dreadful season right and in, in europe and obviously it was the worst with the going happened. down <laughs> like all these things kind of happening right oh and, my god yeah i mean cr you know, crevasses opened up in europe where they found parts of napoleon's army and you know elephants from what's his name that came from the elephants from the <laughs> middle east <laughs> were there and uh you know like tumbleweeds rolling down the um inside the town where the they usually have people you know skiing down into the town so the, it, there was no market no sales no add-on orders no booking next season it was just a, a giant nightmare worst winter in 100 years in europe and what like what happened after that after you guys sold it was uh we sold it and we kept doing what we do best is doing our focus on our other, our other projects. We launched a few other lines like VSTR and we did a thing with uh, Dane Reynolds. The VSTR thing was with Kelly. The Dane Reynolds thing was called, uh, ooh, what was it called? <laughs> Can't even think of it now. now. Summer Teeth. And uh, we also did a, uh, a line of sport called ST Comp that was a sports line, kind of like what Viore is today, but we, we did that a while back. And so, also, we had all these other projects we had going for our core. Like that's the, the the company we were, and today we're board riders with you know eight brands, including the Billabong, yeah. Billabong, and Ruka, and and uh, Element, and and Von Zipper, and all that. So we've always been about you know brands with their own identity, their own uh, product people, marketing people, and salespeople, but with a common back structure with the yeah. shipping and sourcing and and uh, operations and lawyering and accounting and all that kind of stuff and what's happening now is there any sort of things that you can you can mention and talk about any kind of campaigns or or, or uh, things that you guys are working across the different brands uh, well we, you know we just did the we just did the full stranger things uh campaign yep. with quicksir which has been amazing <laughs> we sold a lot of product in and it's selling through and the show's out now and people love it and it's you know, Netflix is just huge with it. We did our own sort of simultaneously marketing thing, which I'm, I know you've seen the video, but it's fantastic if you have it. It's the Stranger Things Quicksilver video. So we were allowed with a collaboration with Netflix and Stranger Things to do our own set of product in addition to the product that's in the, in the show. So both those product lines are selling and some of them are bright having to do with, you know, the normal life in uh in stranger things and we have the upside down world stuff which is all black and silver and evil and <laughs> things and monsters and and people just love it i mean the show is fantastic it's a little yeah. bit scary i would say but kids just love it so it's scary mixed with humor set in like a very awkward age bracket for kids which is sort of like your junior high school going into high school so it's it, it's a really been a fun thing to be associated with and we have a whole, you know, we always have collaborations going and coming with all of our brands, and uh, we have a lot of great stuff going on in the, in the sustainability world, trying to maximize mm -hmm. our sustainability and eco footprint. And we have a lot of things going on in our foundation area, um, and uh, and you know, I think that there's there's always a million moving parts in any, any company, and and they're certainly here. We have all this situation now with you know recession. We have the whole thing that has happened at the docks in Long Beach for the past, you know, call it three years now, just yeah. supply chain disruption. Uh, for there was a year where nobody in the industry had wetsuits. And now everybody has wetsuits. Now they're all on sale because there's too much inventory. I mean, it's just, just flips. Oh, around. well, okay. So it's like the whole Crazy. thing shifted then between sort of people like one of them during COVID and then now it's sort of. Yeah. I don't even know if it's, it's COVID related. It's just, we, there was a, there was a, backlash at the docks already uh, okay. a mismatch of containers and the ships lined up and couldn't get it off and then certainly covid got in there and then all of a sudden everybody all everybody globally just said no more stuff to all their suppliers so all the suppliers go no more stuff to the vendors and the vendors go no more fabrics no more stuff so it just got backed up for call it two or three months to all of a sudden yeah. covid they figured out was you know a, a boom for our industry because everybody wants to be outside they want to go surfing they want to be on the beach they want to be with their family so we everything blew up in the surf industry but but everybody goes okay we want everything now and we're, well, we just canceled everything so this whole <laughs> disruption which really has taken up till even now to get over it set the whole world back 
you know, probably a year just trying to get caught up with supply and match it with the demand and make sure the sizing and the colors and the styles and the, and the stuff that all our retailers want, we were able to supply. And you'll yeah. you call any retailer or any manufacturer, they'll tell you the same thing. It's been really, really tough through this period. But, you know, it's got to get through it like any other. Is it, is it evening out, you reckon? Or do you reckon it's sort of like another six months or longer? Oh, it's still, it's still going, but I, I'd say it's definitely getting better. But now we have recession, so I don't know what, what that's going to do to the mindset of the buyer or that, you know, people stop buying for a while, you know, uh, consumers might get scared. I don't know. It's it's not good. You know, and then we have this war going on, which has disrupted a lot of our businesses in Europe. So it's, you know, when you're a global company like we are, it's there's a lot of, you know, things going on just and they've always gone on. So you say, like, oh, this is the first time this is ever. It's not. There's There's stuff. I mean, I, I, I um, talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs starting their business, whatever. And I always tell them there's, there's the business plan, the plan, the plan, the plan. But the actual journey is so much different than the plan. So just get used to it. Things change in two seconds. And uh, this war, recession, these are things that are new, rather new. But they're, you know, next year, the year after the year, there's going to be other new stuff that come on. You know, yeah. certainly the... The storms and the climate, it's things happening in the world with the weathers and, and the rivers overflowing and the fires has, has, to, has also affected our businesses, you know. So things happen and they affect it. So you just got to be ready for it. Would you say that was that would be one of the main things that, that you would you would tell them? So if people are kind of looking like looking to get into business either for themselves or, you know, if they're going to start a company. Would you sort of say that you know the like these things you, you just got to go you, you got to go through the journey and things will happen? Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. You just gotta um, gotta stay steadfast if you're really serious about what you want to do and becoming you know known for it and have a good product and you know make some money, whatever. You just gotta gotta put your head down and just power through it. And a lot of people can't they either run out of money, they get discouraged, they you know their partner leaves them, they get another job. I mean, so many things happen as you uh, as you in businesses when you start them and get them going and continue. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, what's, what's something from, 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 from like on a, the business standpoint, would you say is, is something that you're most proud of uh, look, looking back? Well, like I said, when we first started, you know, we, we went in, we would go into a typical surf shop and there'd be, you know, it's like 800 square feet and they'd have surfboards and, wetsuits and you know wax and you know and t-shirts for the brand on the surf shop that was it so we went in there and we actually sold them something that they could only get there which was amazing because you know not, not many things only sell to like one distribution platform so and we were sort of there i mean there was no industry there was no supply like now today when people start brands they go they call it la somebody shows up with 10 blue bags you look at a million different products you just cut and paste and plug and play and then off you go there was none of that back then. So I, I, and now our industry is ginormous and it, um, and it, it feeds and houses and pays for college education, whatever, for hundreds of thousands of people. So I'm really proud of that, that what we start, not that we were the starter of it, whatever, but it, when we started, there was none of that. And now it's grown into something really spectacular. And I'm really proud of all the people who have come through Quicksilver and now board riders that, We've coached, we've taught, they've learned on the job. And now they're off, started companies, running companies, um, employed in companies all over the freaking world. And that makes me really, really proud. And whenever I see somebody, they they always tell me, oh my God, those days at Quicksilver back then between sort of 80 and, and the year 2000 were just like, they were the best ever. And I, I love hearing yeah. that, you know? And I, I'm really proud of like, every time I see somebody wearing something from Quicksilver or really any of our brands, I, I still get goosebumps and I still get tickled and I still just love it. So I don't think that ever goes away. And uh, I've been cursed with looking at guys' shorts my whole life. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But <laughs> I looking, look at the gain book. pleasure yeah. when I see our brand on a pair of shorts. <laughs> nice one. And, um, but what's the best way if people want to, if, if they want to get in, uh, if they want to reach out to you and get in contact, how, how can they do that? Uh, well, I'm at 
you know, bob.mcknight at quicksilver.com, same email address I've had for a million years. It's always been on the public ledger on all the Wall Street stuff. So I'm not hiding from it. That's my email. So so that would be the way probably. Nice. Well, Bob, um, thanks so much for your time. It's been yeah amazing uh, hear, hearing the stories and yeah how, how it kind of, it, it all started and um, yeah, just the journey over the last 45 years uh, and look forward to seeing what's coming up as well uh, with, with the future campaigns <laughs> and yeah, really, really enjoy it with, with, with the Stranger Things um, footage and campaign that's, that's, that's been cool to watch. Okay. Well, thank you for everybody for listening. <laughs>